Good evening. Hey guys. Um, told you a lot of different things about my myself, and uh, one of the things I share with you was all the dark stuff that I, I dealt with, both as a kid and as uh, as an adult. Um, you know the so-called ghost stories. Well, I'll tell you just th some of the things that that I've been a part of. Um, I'll try to start from my earliest memory. Uh, we lived at uh, 43 Garfield Place in Ridgewood, New Jersey. Um, Mom was uh, divorced by now, so single parent. Uh, because she worked, I would stay with my grandparents most of the time. Uh, no interaction with, um, you know, after school stuff because I got picked up and then hung out with them. So uh, my earliest memory is at uh, that place in Ridgewood where uh, I was having a nightmare and so I guess I was about uh, five or six. Uh, I was having a nightmare and I woke up with my hand on my throat. Um, my sister and I, my sister was uh, had some friends over and tag along younger brother was playing with them. We were playing, she had a game called Lucy's Tea Party look it up you can see what it looked like and we're in our our bedroom because there was only there were only two bedrooms in the house so Diane and I shared one and mom by herself um, all the shades <clears throat> in in our house at 43 Garfield went up at the same time um, spooked us out uh, tremendously the other memory, or the last memory, <clears throat> excuse me, the last memory I had there, I had there was um, uh, there was an attic, and that's where uh, Diana and I kept our toys. That's where we played. We had sections. She was across, the stairs would go up and divide that attic, and she was on one side, and I was on the other with all our stuff. I remember my sister swapped out. She changed. She changed sides because she decided the side I was on was better. So one day I walked up there and all my stuff was on the other side. Um, well, we were up there and there, you know, kind of got ch chills, but not because it was cold. And uh, there was one time where there was a whole bunch of bees that just came out of nowhere. And, um, and we ran down the stairs and I rarely went back up. Uh, I just, it was, it was really spooky. Uh, and, you know, you can chalk that up to just being a kid and overactive imagination. You know. So, when my mother got married, and this was in the summer before I began third grade at a new school, um, we moved to 105 Forest Road in Glen Rock, New Jersey. And it was there that I had a whole bunch of other stuff going on. Um, I had to sleep down into in the basement uh, because my stepfather's mom was staying with us, and you know you're the youngest kid, so they put up a little cot in the corner of the basement. And that's where I had to go. And already I had kind of, every time I went down there, I got the, you know, the chills, the, the shudders, feeling like something was watching me. But, you know, again, chalk it up to a kid's imagination. I, I remember, um, huh, I remember there was a, a, uh, a moment where I saw, and I shared this with you guys, I saw a figure, um, down in the basement and it was on the other side of the of the basement where I was I had lights on in this one section and the other section was dark but I could see a very you know it's dark but I could still see 
this figure darker than dark. You know, like the the darkness you see right here, all over here. Um, but yet I could still see a figure in that. And I remember it was it was um, it looked like someone was wearing a trench coat and had a uh, uh, a long brimmed hat like the way the um, the Amish wear. And it didn't move. It just like it like it was staring at me. And I had no I had no recourse. You know where would I go? You know. No one cared if I said, hey, there's someone downstairs, you know, um, because, again, kids' imagination. But that really freaked me out. My stepbrother one time, he uh, he went nuts with a, a BB gun and started chasing me around the basement, shooting uh, the BB gun at my head, just out of the blue. Don't know where it came from. Um many times when I would go down the stairs or when I was coming up the stairs from the basement I always felt like someone was just like like right here you know behind me the whole time and I tried not to let it get to me and I you know but it felt like it was but you know right on me all the time uh, even when I went back as an adult I still felt that same way down that basement during the day not so, you know so much but when it's dark and stuff it just felt like there was something still there and um, my sister told me a story, and this one was really spooky. It still freaks me out. And she, I, I reminded her of this uh, several years ago, and she doesn't remember telling this to me. But she said that I, I, I walked into her room, and she said, Douglas, you know better than to walk in my room without knocking first. Um, this is what she told me. She said, I walked in a room, I, I turned and, and looked at her mirror. Um, I, th I can't remember if she said I grabbed a brush or something like that, started combing my hair. Or, but again, my sister said, you saying, what are you doing? And I turned to her and she said, it was me, but it didn't look like me. My, my face was di different. And I said, I want to kill you. And then I, I slowly looked back into the mirror, um, put down the brush, and then walked out of her room. And she said she followed me immediately. And um, our bedrooms at this new house at 105 Forest were only separated by a wall. So I made a left, and you know I'd have to open the door, and I'd go into my bed. But she said that... I, I vanished from her, her sight for just a, a second. And when she came around the corner, uh, I was already in bed, uh, sound asleep. No sound of the door opening, you know. And she just was like weird how I got from her room to my bed that quickly uh, when I was just walking slowly. And she said that really freaked her out. Of course, well, how would you know? Would it not? So I had weird stuff going on um, in the house. Uh, I would get scared as a kid at night when no one was around. It always just felt like there were people there. Um, so every summer, now I'm getting a little older. Every summer, I'd go and visit my aunt and uncle. Uh, Ruth and Charles Nordhausen, and they lived in uh, Warren, Massachusetts. Um, and we'd stay for about two weeks, and it was the best part of the year for me. It was getting away and being with my aunt and uncle, and I've told you reasons why I, I, I wanted to get away. Um, and, you know, I felt loved with them, and so did my sister. And they would always take us to places, uh, you know, museums, art exhibits, dramas, musicals, uh, and such. Uh, so I would be in my uncle's den where they had a cot for me. My sister would be in the bigger guest, you know, bedroom that had a full size bed. Uh, I remember being in 
in bed and I had the hall light was on um, and it looked like there were like if you go like this you know you see like the after effect of where my hand was I kept seeing that going back and forth different angles all through that hallway um, I remember telling them one time I saw a face staring at me um, from the outside window my uncle said you know I think maybe I was in fourth grade now said um, that's impossible because you're on the second story you know no one's gonna be able to stand outside and look in the window but I but there was a face there and of course again scared but who believes me so you know you just deal with it you, you know put the covers around your neck or around your head and, and Try not to think about it. Um, when the lights went out, I could see this even even more. Over the years, um, every time I went there, I had that same thing happening. As I got older, I could still see these things. I could still feel um, this presence, and it was scary. Always, never was it feeling comfortable or curious, but it was hair-raising scary to me. Uh, my sister, who was four years older than me, she was off to college. So for my last four, the last four years, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth grade, maybe ninth, tenth, to eleventh, um, I would uh, I would be there by myself, and you know you're more mature and stuff, and I'd still have these these things going on. Now I was in the other room. Uh, where my sister used to be and same kind of weird stuff feeling like there was right over me the whole time like they were trying, trying to touch this kind of thing you know you just feel that um, so I share this with you because uh, uh, years later after uh, when I went to, uh, to Maryland um, I, I had a friend named Karen and uh, she, I brought her, you know, I had feelings for her and, and she shared it. She had the same for me. And so we were enjoying each other's company and it was the only person I ever brought with me to my aunt and uncle's. And um, she was upstairs now in that guest bedroom and I stayed downstairs on the, on the sofa in the living room. It turned, it pulled out into a bed. And when the lights were off, I had the most <clears throat> activity of stuff around me and the greater amount of, of um, trepidation. She comes downstairs. It's like 1.30 in the morning. She said, I saw the light on. Um, and she started telling me what she was experiencing. And she was describing to me the same stuff that I knew about and, and experienced all those many years as a kid and it just it was like you know a light coming on saying well you know I didn't tell her about this stuff and it happened to her too in the same room in the same house in, in Warren, Massachusetts uh, and so uh, we prayed with each other and I said okay you go upstairs I'll turn the light off and I'll just trust in the Lord and and um, because you know these things can't hurt me and that was a good step for me to kind of not let these things get a hold of me anymore in terms of my thoughts and scare me um, but that was an interesting memory so um, I move f further now um, a few things happened with when I moved into to Maryland my bed would shake there and my father's like no we didn't have an earthquake and it must be your imagination <laughs> it's the same stuff and I'm like my bed was shaking you know and, and again like once or twice again you couple it to your, your you associate it with the imagination but uh, in this regard you know but it keeps on happening it was like wherever I go this thing whatever it is follows me or things follow me like they're attached to me you know, going from Ridgewood into Glen Rock into Massachusetts into Maryland. Um, <clears throat> oh, yeah. Go back a, a few years. When I at 
in Maryland with my aunt and uncle. They had friends called the uh, the Knowles who, who lived in Rhode Island, and um, they took us there for a few days. It was right off the uh, the ocean, and um, and so okay, great. They had two real nice dogs there, and I remember they had a wicker a wicker chair that was hanging from the ceiling and you had to kind of climb up on stuff to get into it. Um, well, everyone, they had, uh, the adults had a, uh, um, a dinner date where you had to wear a, a tie and, and a jacket. And since I didn't, since I didn't have one, um, I was, I was left alone and there was no, I don't think there was a TV. I just had a, um, a book to read so you know everything's fine I'm reading the book you know I'm re relaxing with it um, and then suddenly the two dogs that were so friendly and, and loving um, started staring at me and growling like they wanted to rip my throat out I, I mean that was really scary to me and um, and it started getting worse and worse and worse and so I I quickly got up on the sofa onto the table and up into the uh, the wicker chair and they then started barking at me and growling at me and they sat underneath me like if I got down there I'd be dead and um, and I was in there for about two hours until till everyone got home and I told uh, my uncle what happened and of course that was dismissed again your imagination always always that that freaked me out um, visiting my my mother um, in Glen Rock when I was living in, in Maryland uh, she was parked in front of the post office in Glen Rock and she asked me to go and um, put some letters into the mailbox so as I'm walking as I did that and I'm walking um, towards the car on the sidewalk there was a guy who was walking his big dog and he had this really long leash I've never seen a leash as long as this one and and I'm giving this dog and the guy wide berth you know and suddenly the dog uh, pulled his owner and ran at me and snapped at me and I'll show you with my hand um, I'm here and I saw all I saw was the nose and the teeth and it went like this and I pulled just enough and it got it pinched right here and bit into my neck right here on the side and um, it was I was bleeding and the guy's just like ah, it's nothing and he kept going and I was in shock um, ended up going to the doctor where I got a tetanus shot and the guy just totally he said it was my fault his dog never did that so I must have done something to spook him but you hear these stories that I'm telling you and it's it's you can see there's a pattern okay so um, while I'm in Maryland uh, and and I wasn't you know going to church and I was kind of pulling away from um, from that with all that I went on in my life I went I had a lot of anger because of what happened at 105 Forest Road um, and and I didn't you know uh, there's a psychologist or counselor at our high school and he said that one of you two has to leave that residence because one of you two is gonna you know kill the other one with with all that was going on so you know it was good that I left when I was 18 but I had all this anger on me and I had a friend uh, a person I was getting to know in um, at the Howard Community College who said that she wanted to say hey and get to know me but you know um, as a friend but um, she said I looked so angry unapproachable angry didn't realize how much anger I was carrying with me uh, so I started doing uh, I started getting more involved in the world and stuff and because as you know I have like a sixth sense and things sometimes I just know things or I see things very rarely and there's no control over this at all but um, uh, it, it has happened 
So uh, I was getting involved in all sorts of stuff, including um, the uh, tarot cards, because as I, was, I I did that first as a kind of a you know joke, and I was studying it. Um, but a lot of the stuff that I predicted with the cards came true. Like uh, one friend who one asked me about a girl, a girl that he liked, but he didn't think liked her. Uh, she liked him, and uh, it had something to do with death. And there was a death in her family not too far after that. So I started getting into this stuff, and and I walked away from from church for a while. But, of course, the Lord got me, pulled me back. And I started going to all these other churches, different churches, asking questions, challenging uh, what they were teaching um, and stuff. And that's how the Lord pulled me back in. But so I had that little bit of background. Uh, now move forward. Uh, it's 1991. And I've graduated from University of Maryland College Park. I was looking for work um, and couldn't find anything. I was either overqualified or underqualified. Go figure that out with um, what I was looking for. So um, as the Lord was getting me closer and closer, it turned out that I was getting a call to serve as a pastor, and as you know. Uh, moving forward now, I go to, I'm go. i in St. Louis, uh, where the seminary is at, Concordia Seminary. Uh, drove my battered car that had no air conditioning with everything that I owned I could fit in there and started my life in grad school um, and by the way in order to get to grad school I had to take a bunch of exams and I got 100% on the Old Testament lesson and a 98 on the New Testament lesson and a 98 on the um, church or uh, history Bible history general uh, which, you know, my memory was good that, back then. So, seminary, things were were cool. You know, nothing really going on that I can remember at this time at, at seminary in the first year. But um, second year and stuff, there was, like, things that were going on in the, uh, uh, in the cafeteria. It's a really big building. And then I, I noticed that, and I brought it up to some other people. I said, have you noticed this such and such? And I'm like, yeah, I've noticed such and such. And um, and at night, because I would, I would work there, you go in there, man, it was it was uh, brutal uh, in there. Um, so, you know, a lot of people said that they recognized there was something going on, and then you hear stories about that it was been haunted uh, with, you know, demons uh, and stuff or whatever it is. Uh, I go to uh, get my call, uh, my assignment, I should say, for vicarage. That's the third year and four years in ministry. And it was in New Orleans. And I told you this story about um, uh, there was a uh, there was a, a known witch in the in the area, a male, like a warlock guy, and uh, he had like a typical. Um, spooky house with the black uh, metal fence that had sharp tops to it along the sidewalk and knowing that there was a witch in there I decided to go and it went stand there and I started praying for him um, and it wasn't too much longer after that and again I, I lose time now if it was the same night you know or down the road I can't remember but um, I woke up to something that, I mean, squeezing my throat and crushing my chest. Hard to breathe. Very, you know, scared me. Woke, I mean, woke me up for this. Um, and I was, I kind of felt being pushed out of my bed and uh, chasing me. And I went around the corner. It's almost like a shotgun house to the, to the front door, compelled. And I opened it and there... Um, the, the witch was who said if you ever pray for me again I'll kill you or something to that effect um, okay so again you just had a nightmare it didn't really happen you know all that stuff oh it happened 
um, scared the heck out of me. There were uh, the area I lived in was it was on Desire Street and um, high crime rate there, and, and people shot guns and there were bullet holes that were in the house that I was in. Um, wasn't a clean house full of cockroaches and the flying ones are like that big that fly across the room. So um, my best friend Sean, uh, he came to visit me uh, and uh, he always wanted to come to New Orleans and so he was going to stay for a week. I thought that's great, you know, get to do stuff with him and, and uh, have a good, you know, have a good time and, and, and stuff and uh, so he stayed in, in the, the room that I normally uh, slept in and I, I was on the sofa. Um, so the first night there, all right, he was still sleeping when I got up and we were going to, um, I was going to go to work and then we'd get together and go downtown to New Orleans. But when I got home from work, there was a note that said, uh, Doogie, he called me Doogie. I missed, I didn't realize how much I'd missed my wife. Um, sorry for doing this to you, but I, I just had to go. And it was, it was really, you know, odd to me, like, you know, no communication, no phone call, just up and gone, kind of hurt my feelings. Um, but, you know, we're in the forgiveness business, right? So, well, I said, that's a, that's a kind of love that I would love to have one day, um, to miss my wife so much. So, uh, yeah. Finished up my time in, in, in uh, New Orleans, and I went back to uh, seminary, graduated seminary. Um, and I'm going to go back. There's one more story from seminary. Uh, uh, and move move now to, to um, um, I'm married now with uh, Melissa, of course. <laughs> and uh, we decided to drive, um, with her encouragement, to drive to Houston, which is not too, that far away from San Antonio. Uh, to see Sean and Ann. And while we're at the dinner table there in their house, Sean remembers, uh, we just started talking about the weird stuff that we've, uh, that I've experienced. And Sean looks up and he says, Doogie, I never told you about uh, that day in New Orleans. You know, I'm like, well, yeah, you said you missed your wife. He says, no. <laughs> I mean, I did, but he said, but that wasn't the reason. And he told me, and this is now Melissa, your mom, sitting with me so she can confirm this with you. That he started telling me the story about how he was woken up in his sleep, felt like something was choking him and crushing his chest. And he's never been more scared in his life that he could not stay in that house another night. That um, was like, you know, okay, confirmation of there is definitely something that has been following me um, and it's been getting worse and worse. As I started getting closer and closer to God, um, these things got worse and worse. And the, um, and it made me think like, you know, I know Satan does not have, God's omnipotence, but it just made me think like if he knew that I was going to study, you know, become a pastor, and all this time he was trying to keep me from it, and he almost succeeded. So um, that freaked both Melissa and your mom and I out. All right, so one story left uh, back at seminary. Ooh, um, even the lights went out. Uh, back at seminary. Um, my fourth year and I'm in my dorm room and it was a double double size room so um, a little smaller like than this one uh, for the bed and stuff and then it was like a uh, sofa in the other room so I'm in bed and 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 they had these cots that I swear were as old as Luther Martin Luther was um, left over from his time most uncomfortable things uh, well, same thing that happened to me in New Orleans with the crushing of the 
chest and the squeezing of the throat happened. Now I'm a little more mature now in my in my walk with God and I started praying. I started praying the Lord's Prayer. I started thinking of scripture verses. I said in Jesus name leave me you have no power over me and uh, the squeezing continued and the pressure continued. I slept in my underwear uh, then so um, I, it got too much to, for me that I could not I could not get rid of this thing even though my faith was stronger and I felt more secure that um, the Lord is with me I ended up running out of my dorm room and again being chased um, down the stairs out the out the dorm room once I was outside I felt somewhat safe the only person that was up around three o'clock in the morning was the guy who did the switchboard um, they had a switchboard right across there uh, so I went in there and I'm in my underwear and I said hey man I'm sorry there was just something I was just experiencing that freaked me out and uh, I just realized I, I didn't grab my keys and here I am in my underwear and talking to this guy he said uh, Doug if, if, if you only knew how many times I've seen seminarians running around in their underwear around here uh, because this has happened to a lot of other um, students apparently for a very long, long time so whether this was the same thing that was following me all my life or something new uh, who knows who cares right but that's a story about me running out and uh, so he he got up and let me use his key and then I put like something in the door gave him back the keys and got back into my dorm room so there you go there's there's all the all that stuff um, ha had some stuff going on in Pittsburgh in my first call um, but I can't remember too many details on it um, told you that I uh, I'll tell you more about my ministry there in another another video this is 30 minutes and I'm kind of probably putting you guys to sleep but I wanted to just give you all the stories here um, yeah so we move into this house and uh, there are a few things that have gone on here. Melissa and I would be standing here and we'd smell cigarette smoke. Well, no one in the house smokes. But it was very strong. And I told my neighbor about a few you know, weird things and he said, well, do you know that there was a, a man here who died and in this room where I'm in right now, and a chair right across from the um, fireplace, and I'd feel here. I'd feel like if you go like this, like something was doing this, like pulling on the hairs in your neck, and you could feel the hairs lift up, but not from scared, just like someone's touching me. Um, Ryan, you said. Uh, something like you heard a voice um, saying be quiet but there was no one in the hallway um, your mom told me a couple days ago that there were things that were moving around in the room and Ryan said stop it I'm trying to study <laughs> uh, so there's been a few things here but not as ma not malevolent um, nothing that's really scary just kind of like Ooh. You know, but that fear, not not here with that. But um, I started thinking about a story, and uh, I have a lot of good ideas. But the thing is, I forget a lot too, so it's hard for me to actually write a complete book or novel. I keep forgetting where I was and how much I've written and what I've written. Makes it difficult, right? But um, the story was, and this would be um, uh, fiction, the story would be that uh, those who die uh, in Christ, of course, belong to Christ. And those who die out, uh, 
rejecting Christ, belong to Satan. So though we all sleep, um, my story idea was that Satan owns these people, and so he can do with them as he feels, as he, so he can wake them to do his bidding. And so instead of us having ghosts, which su suggests the idea that um, there is no heaven and there is no sleep, as scripture says, but that people hang around here and they're wandering and they're lost. My story idea was that Satan is using them. For what better way to convince a Christian that the Bible is all fake than to believe that a loved one is still around, trying to get their attention, trying to call them, trying to communicate with them. And so you have, you know, you have these these people who say, you know, yes, she's wearing, she said she, her favorite, her favorite sweater. She wishes she'd wear it more, you know, and this woman describes the, the sweater of this long deceased mother, kind of as an example, and no way that she would know that. So it convinces them that their loved ones are still here and not in heaven. Now I'm getting attacked by flies. I don't know where. Okay. Um, so, um, but that was my idea that, that Satan uses them to help convince people that there is no heaven. There is no God. Um, I thought that was an interesting take. You know, again, it's not scriptural, so again, and it's just a fictional idea. Uh, trying to think if there's anything else uh, that I wanted to share with you. Not really getting anything right now on that, so. Uh, but there you go. There's been a you know, number of, of stories and, uh, you know, coincides with uh, a lot of weird things that I have experienced in my life and and uh, you know demons are in the Bible Jesus dealt with them uh, there were some that the disciples could not handle and Jesus said these are ones that are too powerful for you so we know that it's like instead of these things trying to that, that trying to pull me away from the Lord actually it makes it a stronger case for Satan says that he is seeking uh, us to devour us uh, he wants us destroyed so be on guard and be alert if these things happen to you remember that uh, as as you used to sing with the veggie tales God is bigger than the boogeyman right eh? um, just you know but I think I think I don't think you guys are gonna have to worry about about that stuff. Um, but anyway, there you go. So there's uh, childhood memories. About 40 minutes here of me uh, going on and on. Uh, <laughs> and uh, but again, I wanted to to get this down uh, and share with you because I I am recognizing guys, and you're gonna hear me say this probably a number of times, but my memory is going. Uh, I am not who I used to be in terms of uh, even my personality. A uh, lot, of, lot of stuff being taken from me. Uh, and so it makes me think, like, will it get worse to the point that I'll, f I'll forget these things? And they're not really that important. It's just stories that your dad went through. But confirmations and stuff. Um Okay, so there we go. I'm done. Your pastor father stop is going to stop talking now. Um, today is November the 16th, 2017. And again, uh, if you see this video and you've watched all the way through, that you are reminded that I'm making other ones um, to try to just share with you uh, my history and and stuff that I've learned uh, because I've one thing I've learned uh, as over the years is don't take things for granted don't believe that you're gonna have today or tomorrow what you've had today uh, time goes by very fast and you know that my dad died a few years ago 
and you know just suddenly you always think you're gonna have time uh, and <clears throat> who knows I could be here for another year another day another decade um, <clears throat> but that's why I'm sharing these with you because no one knows and we're not meant to know but uh, I wanted to do this for a long time <clears throat> We have the technology to do it. Maybe you'll think it's cool years years from now. You know, I'm gone and you're looking and you're saying, boy, dad was young and spooky because I got this light on here and the beard, right? All right, guys, you take care and I love you tons. Bye.